Welcome to the worldwide free seminar of the Family Dog Project, live from Budapest. The event is proudly sponsored by Purina. So welcome everyone in the room and in front of the screens. Uh, my name is Anna Gergely and in line with uh, Adam's talk, I would like to show you one of our latest study with the UMO. So let's see. As Adam also mentioned, there are dozens of studies which show that dogs are experts of the human pointing gesture. So if they have to find a hidden food from two potential hiding places and the human in the picture, which is Gobby here, pointed at one of the hiding place, the dogs are very skillful in finding the hidden food based on this signal. And they are really experts in this task. It does not matter if the signaler is their owner or an unfamiliar experimenter or if the signaler is projected on a screen or if we do a cross pointing, pointing with the leg or cross pointing with the leg or if they have to choose between more than two hiding places. So they have no difficulties in finding the hidden food based on the signal. So we can say that they are experts. Okay, and moreover, they outperform wolves and our closest relatives, chimpanzees, in this task. So we can raise the question, why? One hypothesis is that during the process of domestication, humans selected dogs for being sensitive to this kind of human gestures, which contains this directional element movement. Several studies supported this notion. For example, uh, Marta Gacci and her colleagues show that dog puppies outperform hand-raised dog puppies in this task, which means that the experience with humans, when it's equal, dogs are still better than wolves. On the other hand, there is another suggestion which stated that it has nothing to do with genetic uh, domestication. Nothing innate, but it learned during their lifetime, during which dogs have lots of opportunity to observe and learn about our gestures. It's also supported with some scientific results. One is show, well, one showed that family dogs outperform shelter dogs in this task, which basically suggests that the lifetime experience have an effect on dog's skill. In the last five years, it has been also suggested that these two mechanisms, the evolutionary and developmental processes, both involve in such social skill in dog, but the relative contribution of these two is really difficult to distinguish and measure. Why? The problem is the partner, the human partner in the experimental conditions, because, as I've mentioned, dogs have lots of opportunities during their lifetime to observe humans and learning about our behaviors, gestures, everything. So when we take them to the lab and trying to distinguish between learning and genetical predisposition, it's really, really difficult because the human partner in our situation carries lots of contextual information, so we cannot easily distinguish between these two. And they also have, I mean dogs, also have lots of expectations about our behavior and so on and so on. So one solution is using humans, which is unfamiliar, completely novel, not human or dog-like, that dogs won't have any expectation about its behavior. So we can do anything with them. So what we do, what we did exactly, so the aim of the study was to examine, are dogs able to find a hidden food based on the humans' directional movement, and whether simple and very short interaction with the humo or an unfamiliar human experimenter influence dogs' performance in this two-way choice task. We use a very cute, I think very cute, humo in this study, a remote control car. I don't know if you see it or not. It was a little white remote control car and the human partner was an unfamiliar female human. And we hypothesized that 
dog won't need any previous interaction before the pointing or the signaling phase to be successful in this task in case of the human partner, but they will need some time and learning in case of the novel human partner. So let's see our procedure. First of all, we I have a pointer, I guess. We had four different experimental conditions. Conditions we call them non-interactive and interactive, and in both cases we had a human and a human partner. Okay, let's see what we've done exactly in the non-interactive human condition. The first phase was a familiarization phase. Here you can see that a very robotic, let's say, human was walking around the room in a constant speed and had no interaction with the dog. She did not use any verbal or non-verbal communicative cue during this phase, and it lasted for two and a half minutes. Nothing else. In case of the non-interactive emo, we did the very same, but with this little card. Thank you, it's a little bit loud, but okay. So here you, you can see that we did the very same circling around thing with the Yumo, with the constant speed, and the dog had no opportunity to interact with this car, just watching its movement. But in the interactive groups, conditions, we use the problem situation as an interaction, which I call short interaction. When dogs faced with the problem situation, and they had no access to a hidden food, which was hiding by the human experimenter here in this little biomesh cage. He had the opportunity to reach it, but obviously he didn't succeed. And then when the dog looked at the human, the, dog, the human started to move and helped the dog to reach the food. Okay, so this problem-solving situation was helped by the human, the interactive human partner. We did the very same again with the humor. Okay. And we need very, very talented drivers for this kind of <laughs> test. So here you can see the same hiding. The unreachable food, okay. which is still unreachable. Okay. And when the time elapsed, and the dog looked at the humo, it called the dog presentation with this beeping sound. Yeah. It's not an easy task. And gave the food reward to the dog. Okay, we, repeat, we repeated this whole problem and helping situation six times. So it lasted, again, two and a half minutes, just like in the non-interactive condition. Um, okay. Now, after the familiarization phase, the test phase came, which was same for all the four condition, okay? I would like to just show an example from the human condition. Yeah. Here you can see that the dog's eyes were covered during the hiding, so it had no opportunity to cheat where the food was hiding. And the human experimenter hided one piece of food into the two potential hiding places, into one. The partner called the dog's attention with the same beeping sound. Approached the base here, touched it, and went back to the starting point. And then the dog was allowed to choose between the two. Okay. So it's always getting from the slideshow. Okay. All we've got. Our results show that in both interactive human and interactive humo condition, dogs 
performance was highly above chance level, so they chose the baited container more compared to the non-baited and non-approached one. Dogs in the non-interactive human condition were also above chance level, so they still followed the movement of the human partner even if they had no previous interaction with her. But they chose randomly between the two containers in the non-interactive human condition, so if they had no previous experience with the UMO, they failed to use this approaching behavioral signal. Okay. We were also curious about whether dogs learned anything during this whole procedure. I forgot to mention that with this approaching thing, so in the two-way choice task, we repeated it 16 times. Okay, so I'm sorry, I did not mention this very crucial part of our experiment. So we would like to examine whether they learned anything. So whether they improved during this whole thing. So we just divided this 16 test trial into four conditions. And we found evidence of learning only in the interactive human condition. So in the two human conditions, irrespectively of previous interaction, dogs were very good from the beginning. So they had no experience and no learning about this approaching signal. They utilized it very nicely from the beginning. In case of the interactive humo, we found that during the first trial phase, they were around chance level. But in the third, which contained the ninth to the twelfth trial, they really improved from chance level. In the non-interactive humo condition, we also found no evidence of learning, so dogs in that condition remained in the, at the chance level during the whole test. Okay, last but not least, we wanted to examine also dogs looking behavior toward the partners, and we found that dogs prefer to watch a human when she's signaling, so when she's communicating with them over the UMO irrespectively of interactivity. So, we can say that dogs are able to find a hidden food based on the approach behavior of the UMO. The previous interaction with the agent proved to be crucial for dogs, but just in case of the unfamiliar moving partner, I mean the UMO. We found no evidence of learning when the UMO was not interactive, so when the dog had no previous interaction with them, but we found learning and a very rapid learning when they had opportunity to uh, interact with, with the UMO in a different context before the signaling phase. And of course, not of course, but we expected that dogs prefer to watch the human signal and gesture, which also suggests that they can distinguish between human beings and UMOs somehow. So what we can conclude from our study, our results supported the notion that both evolutionary and developmental processes are involved in the emergence of such social skills in dogs. We think that during the domestication, dogs uh, evolved an inherited sensitivity to this kind of directional cues, but their social behavior is flexible enough to generalize this knowledge to a very different type of agent, which is a UMO, and consider its movement as a signal. So the take-home message is, dogs' social behavior is might be more flexible than we thought. And in the end, I would like you thank you for your attendance, thank all of the supporters and, uh, and everybody who uh, organized this conference, and thank you. Thank you very much for the Thank talk. You. It was really interesting.